Welcome to World Water Week 2022. I'm Alok Jha, I'm your Master of Ceremonies, as we kick off this year's edition of the world's leading water conference. I'm a journalist at The Economist newspaper and also author of The Water Book. So these are topics very close to my heart. With me, I have Gabriela Suhoski. She's the director of World Water Week and Prizes at the Stockholm International Water Institute. Siwi is an organization that's organized World Water Week for more than 30 years. Thank you, Alok. And a warm welcome to everyone joining us online from around the world. We're always excited about organizing World Water Week every year, but this year in particular because the format is a little bit different. Okay, tell me more. What can we expect this year? Well, this is the first year that we meet both online and on site in Stockholm. And we offer about 300 sessions that can be followed on our digital platform. What we're looking for is lively exchange and interaction between participants online and on site as we're looking for diversity um, and inclusion. Uh, we have more content than ever um, on this very own center stage. Okay, now this center stage is very important. Can you tell me the role of this place uh, for the conference? Yes, well, we wanted to create a meeting place where um, we could create collective moments, such as uh, capacity building and trainings, the accelerators that we have in communication and business and leadership. This is will um, you'll see, be able to follow CV Corner, uh, which is our own talk show and meet interesting guests. Uh, and also the wrap-up sessions every day where we um, allow time for reflection and discussions on the topics. So we're excited about very interesting speakers that I know will help us think about water in, in very unexpected ways. Gabriella, thank you so much. And of course, we'll talk much more about what's coming up in World Water Week 2022 a bit later. But first, let's listen to one of today's most original and influential thinkers on how we value water. Andre Snare Magnusson is an Icelandic writer and filmmaker who made global headlines in 2019 when he wrote a eulogy for the lost Oculocal Glacier. Now that eulogy was seen by millions around the world. Andre followed that success with a best-selling book on time and water, which found readers across the world. Today, we'll listen to an address from Andre that offers us a new way to think and talk about the combined crises of climate and water. Hello, everyone. My name is Andri Snell Magnusson and happy World Water Week. We are living very special times when it comes to water. And we could say that in the next 100 years, we might see almost all elements of water shifting in a dramatic way on our planet. How do you talk about something that you could say is bigger than language? We've been trying to understand the concept of the future called sometimes climate change, global warming, and now we call it climate emergency in a, maybe a desperate attempt for us to get world leaders, uh, public media, to understand that we're in, a, in the biggest paradigm shift that humans maybe have ever seen. How do you talk about something that is so big that it exceeds almost all metaphors and all comparison that we have, because we're seeing how all elements of water are going out of balance, that is, glaciers melting, turning into oceans, oceans rising on a speed that we have not seen for 6,000 years, acidification of the ocean, chains of moisture, chains in permafrost, chains in rain and snow. And in a way, you could say that this issue is larger than the, the language that we have, to understand things. It's almost a mythological speed because uh, global leaders, they have never met before to discuss the weather. That is to discuss how they are changing the weather. Genghis Khan, Ramses II, uh, Cleopatra, Napoleon, all these megalomaniac leaders, they did not believe that they could mess glaciers. This is something totally unprecedented for humans to understand that they can actually raise the level of the oceans. We remember from the Bible how Moses parted the Red Sea, but that is quite small compared to raising the global sea level by one meter. That is quite an accomplishment. And the question is, will the future see us with this godly power as tragic gods or wise people that could actually react to the data. 
When I say larger than language, then I can maybe explain. I can say a sentence that uh, I got from a scientist, a friend of mine, and the sentence looks like this. In the year 2100, we believe that the pH level of the world oceans might have dropped from 8.1 to 7.7, .7, and this is the greatest change in the world oceans for 50 million years. So, I just said this, and this is actually one of the most dramatic things that a human can say. But in a very strange way, almost all of the words that I said are uh, beyond meaning for a normal citizen. The pH level from 8.1 to 7.7, .7, how can we understand how dramatic that drop is in a logarithmic scale? The year 2100 is culturally for us out of reach. We can't imagine 2100. Most of the people I know are raised with the year 2000 as, the, as a far future. Most of my friends think that 1970 was 30 years ago. So I think in a strange way, when the people met in Glasgow to discuss what needs to be done before 2050, in a strange way, I feel like maybe people feel like 2050 is 50 years into the future. And when we see 50 million years, that figure is so large that it's just totally irrelevant. So if we look at this on a graph, how 30% of the CO2 emissions end in the world oceans, and look at this drop of the pH level, uh, we are seeing a paradigm shift. That is, we are seeing data that is so significant, so important, so uh, serious, that it actually means that everything that was calculated, thought, designed, produced in the last 100 years has to be rethought because nobody wanted the world oceans to be lost for the next generation. Nobody, I think, actually thought that this was, would be possible. But the problem is the term ocean acidification is almost brand new. It was created in the year 2004, and almost nobody that I know actually understands or is confident with using this term. We are in a paradigm shift, and the problem of paradigm shifts is they can take a long time. It took about 100 years for Copernicus theory to be understood that Earth was actually not the center of the universe, but vice versa. And a new scientific truth does not triumph by convincing its opponents and making them see the light, but rather because its opponents eventually die and a new generation grows up that is familiar with it, said Max Planck in 1950. But the problem with this graph here is that this event is so dramatic and so fast that we can't really wait for a new generation to grow and react to this. And how do we understand 2100? I sat in the kitchen with my grandmother and my daughter, and we were calculating when is someone still alive that you will love? And my daughter did the calculation when she would become as old as grandmother, and she found the year 2102. And we were laughing at that. Imagine you might be sitting in this kitchen in the year 2102, and maybe somebody comes for a visit to have pancakes, just like you're having with your grandmother, maybe a 20-year-old granddaughter. And when is that person 90, like your grandmother? When is someone still alive that you will love? And my daughter does the calculation. She finds out that her granddaughter might be still alive in the year 2000. 170. So I tell my daughter, imagine that you are sitting here with somebody born to 1924, and you yourself will maybe be remembered in the year 2170. You could actually ask your grandmother to tell you a secret. You could whisper this on and ask this person not to tell it out loud until the year 2170. You can connect almost 250 years, only yourself, the people that you know and love, the people that make you, versus the people that you will know and love. My grandmother was a hero of the family. She was a glacial explorer, and she went on a glacial honeymoon in the year 1956, a three-week research expedition to measure and map Vatnajökull, 
Europe's biggest glacier. It was uncharted, unmapped, uh, unknown territory at the time. They were stuck in a tent, my grandparents, for three days when a blizzard was raging outside and asked them, weren't you cold? And they said, cold. We were just married. At that time, the glaciers seemed eternal. It seemed like the glaciers were in context of eternity. But now after they have been measured and mapped for uh, 70 years, we can use this data against climate science and understand how long the glaciers will last. And we see that the glaciers will be lost almost entirely within the life of my daughter becoming as old as my grandmother became. This is nature leaving geological speed, entering human speed. And again, if only this was happening, if just this was happening, we would see an immediate paradigm shift if we really understood it. If only ocean acidification was happening, we would also see an immediate paradigm shift. And of course, the glaciers are not vanishing. They are becoming ocean that will be hitting cities, harbors, and low-lying areas all around the world. So it's urgent more than ever that we connect to dates like 2160, that when a scientist says 2100, we don't feel unrelated, detached, uh, unresponsible, but we feel like that is only halfway within the intimate circle of continuity and love that we have in our immediate families. So we should all calculate when is someone still alive that you will love. I have had the privilege, strange privilege of saying goodbye to the first glacier in Iceland lost to climate change. And I wrote this, Ok Jökull is the first Icelandic glacier to be lost to climate change. In the next 200 years, all our glaciers are expected to follow the same path. This monument is to acknowledge that we know what is happening and what needs to be done. Only you know if we did it. August 2019, 415 ppm of CO2. So that level has already reached 420 ppm. When is someone still alive that you will love? You can think for a minute do the calculation, and then start acting on that immediate date. Thank you very much. Andre Snare Magnuson there really helps us to think differently about the value of water. Now, there are many overlaps between what he's told us and also the theme of World Water Week this year. To talk more about that, I'm now joined by Dr. Jenny Groenwell. Welcome, Jenny. Thank you so much. Now, Jenny is an advisor on water policy and rights at Seawee and a member of World Water Week's Scientific Programme Committee. She and her colleagues play a key role in the development of the annual theme for the conference. So, Jenny, how would you explain this year's World Water Week theme, which is seeing the unseen, the value of water? Well, with this theme, we want to lift the value of water, but we also want to highlight the unseen water in society and nature. The value of water, in turn, can be understood in terms of its financial and economic perspectives, but also in relation to people and development and for the um, nature, the environment and the climate crisis. And so the programme is structured around those three sub-themes. So why is this all important? Does it really matter how we value water? Yes, I really believe that. Um, the way we value water, that we value water, changes everything. Um, so many of the problems and the challenges that we increasingly see around us are related to water in one way or the other. And many of them stem from how we treasure water, or rather how we don't. And if we want to find solutions, we need to first appreciate the real value of water. And we need to see the multiple values of water to us and to nature. So we humans, we depend on water for everything, right? Um, for the domestic uses and for recreation and for the food production and energy production. And of course, business and industry. But water also plays this fundamental role to the ecosystems and the services that we depend on and to nature itself. So it's important to think beyond financial and economic aspects mm. too. Yeah, 
Absolutely. We need to think and discuss beyond the calculation of instrumental and exchange values of water resources. So we need to see the intrinsic value of water itself and also the cultural and relational values of water. I like to think of something that the uh, 2021 Stockholm Water Prize laureate Sandra Postel has said. Society views water in a utilitarian fashion as a resource valued only when it is extracted from nature and put to use. And this is indeed a tendency that we have and which I think that we need to reverse. We need to see the unseen. We need to value the water that is poorly valued in society today. Well, so this brings us back to our theme. What, what is unseen water? Let, let me give you a concrete example. When we illustrate water issues, we tend to go for photos and pictures of surface water bodies, uh, lakes and rivers and the ocean. But water is so much more. It is the rain, the soil moisture, the entire hydrological cycle and the virtual water that is embedded in goods and services and is, of course, invisible groundwater under our feet and the aquifers that function as hosts of this groundwater. And this is something that we will soon hear Dr. Veena Srinivasan talk more about. Okay, well, Jenny, thank you very much. I think you've helped us to understand better why we need to focus on the value of water, mm. not least the invisible water. Mm. You also mentioned how we visualise water, and let's stay on that topic. Next, we'll meet Christian Fisher, co-founder of the online magazine Water Science Policy. Now, that magazine uses art, photos and storytelling to shine a light on some often forgotten water issues. This year, they've focused on groundwater. So let's listen to what he has to say. Hi, and welcome to World Water Week from all of us at Water Science Policy. Water Science Policy, that is not just me. That is more than 100 volunteers from around the world that are mostly young water professionals, volunteer translators, web developers, writers that have created this project over the last two years. They went to Argentina to shoot a documentary. They sailed down the Mekong virtually, produced over 200 articles and more than 1,000 translations. Today I have the honor of representing them and speak about one of our initiatives and the motivation behind it. So let's dive in. The importance of groundwater cannot be overstated. And while many people live in groundwater depleted regions around the world, it is very difficult to show this problem to a wider audience. The fact is that this resource is confined to the underground and as such invisible to people. As a result, the real challenge to a photographer or to a journalist and to all of us in the water sector is then how to present it. At Water Science Policy, we figured that we can change that. And as a multilingual open access platform for water-related science, communication and journalism, we decided to launch the Groundwater Photo Story Competition. This is part of our mission to make water-related content freely accessible to everyone in as many formats and languages as we possibly can. And as you know, visual storytelling is one of the most powerful ways to connect to others, bring faraway problems close to our readers' hearts, break down scientific problems and also make the unseen seen. We received more than 100 submissions from around the world and together with judges from UNESCO's World Water Assessment Program, the Global Water Partnership and the International Water Resources Association and award-winning photographers, we selected three winning photo stories. Number three, The Last Days on Earth by Fatma Fami, who covers the severe environmental and social costs of acid mine drainage in the Snake Park area in South Africa. Number two, Collecting Water by Barun Rashgaria, who shows the everyday routine of women collecting water from waterholes in rural parts of India. And number one, Save Every Drop by Prabhat Chayesh, who covers the stories of salt farmers of India's Ran of Kutch salt marshes, where the next drop of water is often miles away. But there are many more photographers that deserve an honorable mention at this point. So many, in fact, that we decided to launch a crowdfunding campaign for a groundwater photo book with the best 150 pictures that we received across the three main groundwater challenges. That is accessibility, contamination and overextraction. We had an overwhelmingly positive response across countries, age groups and sectors. And many of the stories that reached us had a much greater impact on us than yet another groundwater related article or report. And that is because we were able to relate and connect to others through some truly amazing photography. On a very personal level, those photo stories helped us comprehend that protecting groundwater resources is the only solution for many people without access to safe and affordable water services. And that this resource is crucial to the survival of entire ecosystems. 
For us, the Groundwater Photo Story competition was a major success because we believe that visual storytelling is one of the best ways to reach and touch policymakers and make them and the public interested in the topic, not just aware. Because stories are about people and better policies should be all about better lives for people. And safe and affordable water, which often comes from the underground, is the very basis of such better lives. With this in mind, I hope that you do enjoy the photo book, which you can endorse as of today. And of course, we would really appreciate that. Have a look at our existing photography and writing work at watersciencepolicy.com and maybe we even see you later this year in person for an actual exhibition at UNESCO's headquarters in Paris. From all of us at Water Science Policy, we hope that you do have an exciting and successful week in Stockholm. If you want to meet us, we'll be roaming around on-site and off-site. We look forward to seeing you around and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Christian, for the video and for helping to raise awareness about the urgent threats to our groundwater. Now, that's also the mission of our next speaker, Dr. Veena Srinivasan. She is the director at the Center for Social and Environmental Innovation at the Ashoka Trust for Research in Ecology and Environment in Bangalore. She's joining us online. Veena, welcome. It's so nice to have you with us. Now, you're a leading groundwater scientist who's made people very aware of the serious situation of groundwater in your country. But before we move on to that specific situation, can you just start by explaining to us what, why is groundwater so important? Thank you so much for the invitation, Alok, and it's really nice to be here. Um, firstly, I think it's important to realize that groundwater is uh, a crucial resource that a very, very large population or percentage of the world's population depends on for drinking uh, livelihoods and industry. And uh, groundwater is a much slower moving resource. It moves much, responds much slower to climate change and climate variability. And as a result of that, it's a very important buffer against climate variability and change. And so if we deplete the world's groundwater or contaminate the world's groundwater, not only do we render millions of people insecure in terms of food and drinking water, but we also remove the crucial uh, buffer that, that helps them mitigate against the impacts of climate variability, both droughts and floods. And so I see groundwater as being critical, uh, particularly for both the poorest as well as the richer populations of the world. It's a problem in both places. And if we don't address it under the threat of climate change, it's going to make people much, much more insecure. Now, people in India are especially reliant on groundwater. Can you just help us understand the situation in your country? Absolutely. So the first thing to remember is that India is unique compared to any other country in the world. India uses far more groundwater. It's one of the highest groundwater users in the world. Uh, the second thing is India is extremely reliant or dependent on groundwater. Almost 80% of drinking water use and industrial water use and 70% percent of irrigation water use is sourced from groundwater. So if we lose access to this very critical resource, then it means that not only are we going to hamper India's continuing economic growth, because groundwater is the bedrock of this economy. In fact, it's been estimated that if groundwater de decline continues, then food production in India is, could actually decrease by as much as 20%. India already has one of the highest density populations in the world, and that means feeding this burgeoning population will become even harder once this critical resource is lost. So I would say that India's, uh, in, uh, on one hand, we have uh, food uh, and water security at threat. On the other hand, we also have a problem with drinking water. One of the biggest conundrums that we have in, in India is that a large fraction of our villages depend on bore wells for their drinking water. And that drinking water is both rapidly declining, as well as in many parts of India, as the water table drops, uh, groundwater gets more and more contaminated with geogenic contaminants like fluoride and arsenic, which means that they are actually drinking a cocktail uh, of poisons. Uh, this means that if we don't address groundwater in a holistic way, with, with, we don't look at both the quality and the quantity aspects, we're going to get, get into being some pretty serious problem uh, in the coming decades. Okay, well, that sounds like a terrifying situation, but what can anyone, what can you do about it? So 
that's a really important question. And I think the most important thing to realize is there aren't any silver bullet solutions. Uh, the reason that we have a problem with groundwater, of course, is uh, that that agriculture in India is dependent on groundwater. And in fact, groundwater has been instrumental in lifting millions of farmers out of poverty with the onset of the Green Revolution in the 1960s. So um, groundwater has, of course, played a very crucial role. And if you look at the global groundwater discourse, there are many who are talking about the Green Revolution in Africa being critical to, remove, to move millions of people out of poverty in sub-Saharan Africa. However, one of the problems is that when you live in hot, dry places, water is limited, which means there simply isn't enough for everybody to irrigate and grow water-intensive crops. One of the biggest challenges with a country like India is the free electricity for farmers policy, uh, which, in the, which was introduced in many states in India in the 1980s, which then allowed farmers to extract as much groundwater as they wanted in order to be able to grow food, both to ensure India's food security as well as to lift farmers out of poverty. But that very policy, which was very relevant in the 1980s and the 1990s in helping India grow out of poverty, has now resulted in over-abstraction of groundwater, which means that we have to see a way to, 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 to conserve groundwater grow less water intensive crops, use water more efficiently. And I would say that not just think about irrigation and groundwater, but also think about who doesn't have access to water. This is one of the biggest pieces, the missing pieces that is never talked about when we in the larger global groundwater discourse, that only half of Indian farmers have access to irrigation in the first place, and the other half are actually rain-fed farmers who continue to be reliant on rain. So just fixing efficiency is not going to fix the problem because as the country gets wealthier, that entire group of 50% uh, of land, which is currently rain-fed, is just waiting to become irrigated. So unless we fix the problem of rain-fed agriculture, of redirection of electricity subsidies from pumping water, sometimes from 1,500 or 1,600 feet, to something which is more uh, productive, uh, less water intensive and gives more uh, uh, more income to farmers, we're not going to be able to tackle the, the problem in, in its entirety. Is this a problem, do you think, that can be solved? I and mean, what about the roles for things like economics or uh, technology, data and measurement? I mean, are these things going to be helpful? And, and, you know, can I ask you to look in your crystal ball? Is this a problem that can be solved if people focus on it? Well, I would hope that we have to solve it. I mean, there is no question of not solving the groundwater crisis because we're not going to reach 50 years later and find that millions of farmers now no, have no access to any kind of irrigation and are completely left destitute. So that's not an option. Um, so I would say that not only uh, it can be solved, but it's absolutely crucial that we, we address this problem on a war footing. Now, um, I do think that, as I said, solutions exist. As you said, economics, data, better tools, better management, these are a, a very important part of the entire picture. But I think that uh, sometimes some of the simpler problems in terms of interagency coordination, in terms of uh, what it takes to make problems actually implementable and work on the ground, uh, and, and often what we find is that farmers are willing to shift to low, less water intensive crops, but there isn't a market. So there isn't cold storage. There aren't the supply chains. The market leakages haven't, uh, have been, haven't been put in place. And so you're not going to get those win-wins that one wants with farmers earning more while abstracting less unless a whole bunch of other things which lie outside the water sector. It has to do with electricity subsidies, with minimum support prices for, uh, for, for farmers, uh, and the building of infrastructure markets and cold storage chains. All of these have to go together in order for the larger problem to get solved. Okay, Veena, well, thank you very much for your time today. It's really brought home, I think, why groundwater is an important matter for all of us. Next, we'll be looking at water from another perspective. We're very pleased to welcome Patricia Guilinga, who's a leader of the Kichwa people of Sarayaku in the Ecuadorian Amazon. She has helped to raise global awareness of the struggle of the people living in the Amazon rainforest, who want to safeguard an ecosystem that's not only important for their livelihoods, but also for the whole of humanity. La Amazonía es una de las cuencas hídricas más importantes de la, del planeta porque es una de las más extensas. Si en algún lugar del mundo estás tomando un vaso de agua, 
piensa que tal vez puede provenir de la Amazonía. Estos bosques amazónicos, estas cuencas hídricas que hemos cuidado los pueblos indígenas, son muy importantes para el planeta, porque son una base fundamental de equilibrio global. Todos nuestros biomas están conectados al equilibrio del planeta con otros biomas importantes. Por eso, la Amazonía es importante y no lo podemos contaminar. La destrucción de la Amazonía consistiría en la destrucción de la humanidad. Nuestra Amazonía es vital para todo el equilibrio global. Nuestras fuentes hídricas son vitales para todo el equilibrio del planeta. Los pueblos indígenas estamos luchando para que estos bosques vivientes, para que estas reservas de la biosfera, para que estos biomas importantes no sean destruidos. Necesitamos el apoyo global para poder seguir resistiendo, para poder seguir eh, defendiendo este ecosistema que es nuestro bosque amazónico. Los pueblos indígenas ya estamos al frente, ya estamos luchando, ya estamos defendiendo, pero necesitamos una conciencia global. Mi pueblo Sarayacu pide que se declare espacios vivientes a nuestros biomas para que el mundo pueda conocer de que es de estos espacios vivientes es donde fluye la vida para el planeta, como un líquido vital, como una conexión que mantiene este equilibrio. Muchas gracias por haberme escuchado. Very powerful words there from Patricia Guilenga, important to all of us. What's inspiring is how an increasing number of people are beginning to see and understand the importance of a more holistic perspective for all societies. It's a paradigm shift and it's happening now. Our final keynote speaker for the day is one of the most influential thinkers in this field. Dr. Ralph Charmy is from the International Monetary Fund and his research is rapidly changing our view on natural capital. Well, I would like to thank the Stockholm International Water Institute for inviting me to present my work on toward an ocean positive economy. In order to develop such an economy, the first question is, where do, where do you want to start? And we want to start with science. What does science tell us about in the oceans? Beyond what we know from an extractive point of view, the oceans are the lungs of the planet. Scientists have now documented that this is, by the way, the open ocean. Uh, for the past 200 years, the oceans have been grabbing roughly about 500 gigatons of carbon dioxide that is sitting in the at the bottom of the ocean below a thousand meters. Science also tells us that phytoplankton, these are microscopic organisms that float in the ocean, also grab amazing amount of carbon dioxide, equivalent to four Amazon forests per year. Science also tells us that not only fauna, but also uh, not only flora, but also fauna, meaning animals, also help to sequester carbon, be it on their body or by their interaction. With the, with the flora itself. In the case of the ocean, it's the great whales, they capture carbon on their body, and they also help to capture carbon by the way they fertilize the phytoplankton through the poop that is very rich in iron, phosphorus, and nitrogen. We also know that coastal blue carbon is very valuable to us in terms of carbon sequestration. I'm focusing on carbon here because of the climate, uh, link to the climate risk, Salt marsh, seagrass, mangroves, these are all amazing bodies that grab so much carbon dioxide and sequester it in, in the sediments. They also provide a great defense against flooding and they provide for greater fish stocks. So what science is telling us is biodiversity is valuable. A living ocean, living whale, living uh, seagrass, salt marsh, all of these bodies are incredibly valuable to us, not only intrinsically, but in terms of ecosystem services to us. We can also put a dollar amount to the science. For example, we can, we can value the carbon services of a great whale and it's roughly over $3 million in today's money. Imagine, compare that with a dead whale who their meat fetches about $40,000. Also seagrass worldwide, this is late, late, uh, recent work that we have done. We show that the, from carbon only, carbon sequestration alone, seagrass is worth over a trillion dollars. You would add another trillion in terms of flood control and a lot more trillions in terms of impact on fish stocks. The open ocean itself, if you were to look at the value of the stock of carbon dioxide that is being sequestered in terms of, car in terms of carbon in the seabed, 
that the worth in terms of dollar amount is worth over 30 trillion dollars. So the living ocean, and I want to underscore living here, is a source of sustainable wealth. It presents a new class of assets. Now the question is, is that enough to have a living and thriving ocean? The answer is no. The, end, the ocean is still remains at risk. It remains at risk mainly to, due to human activity, such as overfishing, deep sea mining, and the fact that we can't get our act together. There's you know, all kinds of fragmented governance of the ocean itself. So what do we really need? What is the third pillar that's missing? Well, that's the policy action, the legal framing of, of nature. What is our vision of nature? Is, should nature have its own rights? Does, should nature have its own person? Should, uh, should we criminalize any action towards nature? We call it ecocide. Or should we just look at nature as an asset that we own and it's basically there for our own benefit? Whatever it is, if we really want to maintain the benefits of a living ocean, we need to look at the ocean as a living system. And we need to have this holistic view that our ancestors used to have and we seem to have forgotten. And that, that holistic view looks at the ocean from a regenerative view rather than the current extractive view of the ocean. Here are a few examples of countries that have already done something similar to that. Chile, in the draft of their new constitution, talk about the relationship between humans the, the, and, and nature. New Zealand's far ahead, endowing personhood on on its rivers, Costa Rica, in our personhood on its bees. When you have all of these pillars, the science, the valuation, and the legal framing, we can think of building markets around nature, in particular, the oceans. On the supply side, you have the science, we have the supply, meaning supply of the ecosystem services. We need this, what we need is the scientific assessment of what we have. We need the valuation. Once we have the legal framing, then, the natural assets become natural capital, financial capital, and then we can take that and go to the markets, and that's the demand side. But under two caveats that are very important, that whatever we sell in terms of services, never the asset itself, the money should come back, to look after the asset in perpetuity, and the stewards of the asset in perpetuity, and that would be the indigenous and the local population. Now, where do we start in the context that we are living in? Well, let's go back to what we're facing. Currently, we're facing two calamities, climate risk and the death of nature itself and the loss of biodiversity. The two are linked together due to human activity, but this potential calamity provides an opportunity to fix the situation. How so? Well, if we were to invest in nature, we call this nature-based solutions, or in the case of the ocean, ocean-based solutions, then we mitigate the risk to the ocean, <clears throat> And by mitigating the risk of the ocean, IPCC reports tell us that the ocean can reduce the climate risk by about 25%. So by going through nature, we reduce the risk to nature and we reduce the risk to, to uh, sorry, and, and we reduce the climate risk and we get two risks, the reduction in the risk, both risks at the same time. Can we make a market out of it? Of course. Here's the market. On the buyer side, you have households, you have firms. Firms, you have financial centers that need to offset their carbon footprint. They would pay money for the system, these natural systems that sequester carbon, such as mangrove, seagrass, and whales, and the money would go to look after in the natural asset. This is a mangrove in perpetuity and the stewards of nature, as I mentioned before, in perpetuity. So we can build those markets. If we were to do so, watch what happens. Everybody wins. Nature wins because we're looking after it. The people that own the assets get the benefit of the, in terms of the revenue and in terms of being stabilized in their land. They don't have to move. They're not forced to move. And the buyers also get to benefit because they get to offset their carbon footprint and they get to meet, the, the, to enhance their ESG scores and to meet their SDG scores. Examples 1, 8, 10, 13, 14, 15. There are no losers in this new economy. So thank you so much for your attention. That was a very refreshing perspective on the value of water from Ralph Charmy and an inspiring way to end this welcome session. I've now got Gabriella back with me. Hi, Gabriella. What are you going to take away from what you've heard so far into World Water Week? 
Well, it's certainly been very inspiring, but also thought-provoking, um, tapping into these many perspectives on how to look at water. And it's clear that we need to have these different perspectives in order to achieve sustainable solutions in the future. And as we've seen um, from different guests today and heard, uh, we need to have the solutions and we need to have different perspectives in order to find models such as how to create nature-based nature economies and how to value a natural capital. And so what's the role of World Water Week in making all of those things happen? So as Jenny mentioned before, the theme of World Water Week is particularly important this year more than ever because we, if we want to achieve change and tackle these issues such as climate crisis and uh, energy and food security, we need to change the way we use water and how we value water. Now, in that sense, World Water Week plays a really important role here as we bring together people from all over the world with various backgrounds and professions. We have the potential to create real change. So in that sense, World Water Week is a platform for change makers. So every meeting and every session taking place at World Water Week can achieve change. So is that your message to everyone attending the conference then? Yes, we need to make the most of it, make sure to bring the interaction between you online and on site so we can bring inclusion and diversity, finding these solutions forward. It sounds like World Water Week could have a huge impact, but it's actually up to people attending to go off and make that difference, isn't it? Um, now, you and I are going to meet up for a midweek check-in on Thursday, I believe. Is that right? That's right. And up until then, we have lots of things happening and we need to make the most of it. So I suggest we get started. Have a great World Water Week, everyone. <laughs>